Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to St. Leonard's. Um, thank you to you all for coming out on this um, rather filthy evening. Um, I do actually see our chair. She has arrived at the back, but she's looking, unfortunately, the worst for the air weather, so I <laughs> won't to ask her to uh, do a quick uh, makeover. So my name's Robert Doyle of the Stratton Society Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to tonight's um, second talk on a horticultural theme of September as part of the Lambeth Heritage Festival. Um, the talk is on Robert Marnock, a giant of 19th century gardening. Um, and the talk is going to be um, by our speaker, Dr. Brent Elliott, who's hidden away behind this pillar, but he, he, is, he is with us. I mean, he's the author of Victorian Gardens. Um, this is part of a wider program um, by the Garden Trust, which is celebrating the um, career of Robert Marnock during 2023. Um, for those of you who don't know a great deal of background beyond what you've seen in the Lambeth Heritage Festival programme, um, Marnock had a career designing private gardens as well as public gardens, and including in those is Park Hill in Streatham, um, for which we are doing our biannual tours this Sunday, of which I think a very few tickets are still available. So if you look at the uh, website uh, and go and book, you might just step up one of the very last ones, as well as a range of public parks um, and cemeteries. Um, so um, I don't think I wanted to add much more apart from the fact that Brent is going to talk for about half an hour. We'll then break for 15 minutes for tea, coffee or wine. Um, but do make a point either during that break um, or at the very end of the evening to look at the very good display boards um, that are on the side here about Marnock. And then after we come back uh, from the tea break, uh, We'll have the finish of the talk and then a chance for questions and any other contributions that you'd like to make. Once again, thank you to you all and thank you to Brad. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Good. I'm here tonight to talk to you about Robert Marnock who is not one of the best known names in the history of gardening. Most people will know the name of Joseph Paxton. A lot of people will know the name of William Robinson uh, without knowing that he was Marnock's protege. But Marnock, despite his long career um, and the immense number of gardens that he administered or created, and we still don't have a complete tally of them, because his papers have been lost. More about that toward the end of the talk. But he deserves to be better known. In the 19th century, it would have been, people would have been surprised by the obscurity he fell into in the 20th. This is partly, of course, because most things Victorian fell into a degree of obscurity during the 20th century. But the sort of hero-worshipping attitude that you can find in the press about Marnock um, shows that they were confident that his name would be remembered. I'm going to quote you a little passage from Dean Hall, who was uh, Dean of Rochester, but before he was elevated to that position, uh, when he was at Conton, uh, he hired Marnock to design his garden. And in his memories, he said, I subpoena my memories to give evidence and my verdict is that 60 years ago, the gardens of England were more pleasingly because more naturally arranged than now. 60 years ago, the 1832. Mr. Marnock, the best landscape gardener of his day, acknowledged and acted upon this conviction. I see him now with his arms folded over his broad chest and his keen gaze surveying the site on which he is to form a garden in reverent meditation how we should keep the congruity between nature and art by a careful obedience to the Latin rule, ars est calari artem, meaning art lies in concealing art. He marked out a plan for a bed here and a tree there. There was to be a walk, then there to be water. And when the plan was finished, on that amplitude of greensward which he ever regarded as of primary importance, he would not find a straight line or an angle. But, if you contemplate him with his arms folded over his broad chest and his keen gaze surveying things, you'll get an idea of the impression that Marnock made on his contemporaries. Now, Marnock, like so many of the important gardeners of the first half of the 19th century, was born in Scotland, in Aberdeenshire. But we first hear of him 
in 1828 at Bretton Hall in Yorkshire. This is now the National Sculpture uh, Park near Wakefield. His pos Barnack's position there in 1828 was foreman of the kitchen garden. He published and resulted an experiment on preserving apples in Loudon's Gardener's Magazine. The following year, he rose to become head gardener there, as George McEwen, who had been the supervisor before that, left to become the famous head gardener of Arundel Castle, and in the last year before he died, the Horticultural Society's gardener. Three years later, Marduk was already moving on. The Sheffield Botanical Garden was being created. Marduk won the competition for the design. Loudon, assessing the various entries, referred to the second best plan by Mr. Taylor, an architect, and said, it is no disparagement to Mr. Taylor's talents as an architect to say that he is not also a gardener. The care and attention with which Mr. Marnock has gone into the subject and the provision which he has made for every description of culture evince a mind deeply imbued with knowledge of his profession. And we should not be surprised if this garden should ultimately be one of the first in point of completeness of arrangement in the kingdom. We beg to congratulate them on their having met with so able a curator. That's a good beginning for a career. There you can see an ordnance survey of the Sheffield Botanical Garden as was. In the 1830s, Loudon was to campaign for every important garden having an axis of symmetry. In other words, a symmetrical composition uh, lending itself to formal development. And Marnock may not have agreed with that in all circumstances, but here you can see uh, it is. Elaborate flower bedding uh, arrangements in some parts of the garden. And there is an early illustration showing, among other things, the glasshouse range that Marnock created. And there is an early 20th century photograph of it, and it is still, or perhaps I should say once again, there. There is not one fragment of the original glass surviving. Wartime damage put an end to that. But the last time, in the 1980s, the three pavilions had been glazed and since the last time I was there, the intervening uh, ridge and furrow ranges have been added. So it's back to at least in shape, if not necessarily in contents, to what it was in Marnock's time. Now, while Marnock was administering the Sheffield Botanic Gardens, having designed them, he became their curator. He also ventured into the realms of horticultural publication. So, a quick bit of background. The first gardening magazine in this country was founded in 1826 by John Claudius Loudon. Loudon, whose portrait you see on the left there, was a man who makes the modern workaholic look like an idler. He published an encyclopedia of gardening that uh, is well over a thousand pages long in very small print and it went through about five different versions during his lifetime. He also published an encyclopedia of plants, an encyclopedia of agriculture, and an encyclopedia of cottage architecture. Oh yes, and The Suburban Gardener, a book on garden design, and The Suburban Horticulturalist, a book on growing fruits and vegetables. Oh yes, and books on greenhouse management, on the design of cemeteries, on growing pineapples. Um, in his later years, he had to have an arm amputated, and he had to be restrained later that afternoon from trying to mow his lawn one-armed. Anyway, for 19 volumes from 1826 until Loudon's death in 1843, the Gardener's Magazine provided a model for a number of sm other small magazines to try to emulate it. But it was the first format for gardeners to submit articles about what they were doing, pose questions, get into debates, etc. And among the gardeners who decided to try to rival Loudon was Marnock with the Floricultural Magazine, which he eight volumes between 1836 and 1842. And this has one advantage that Loudon's magazine did not, color plates. 
Loudon, reviewing the first volume, said, this promises to be one of the best of what may be called, with reference to their size and price, the minor gardener's magazines. <laughs> well, Monarch was not merely illustrating uh, this, uh, but not merely publishing this. He also got involved in another sort of publication. So let me introduce you to another of the figures uh, of the day. George Glennie. As you can see from his portrait, he was a bit of a dandy. He had aristocratic connections, so his first magazine, the Horticultural Journal, later acquired the subtitle and Royal Ladies Magazine. He raised the funds for erecting the statue of the Duke of York, which stands on the steps leading down from Carlton House Terrace overlooking St. James's Park. He started a, a society in uh, the South London Floricultural Society to hold flower shows to try to rival those of the Horticultural Society. And in 1837, he started the first weekly gardening newspaper, the Gardener's Gazette. Now, this was quite an innovation. It's just unfortunate that it happened to be Glenny who uh, innovated it, because Glenny was a waspish, shrewish, thoroughly nasty individual. The pages of whose writings are filled with complaint and abuse uh, and libel about other gardeners. For example, in attacking the Horticultural Society, he accused uh, John Lindley as secretary of embezzlement and of keeping the, the best plants that were sent to them for his own garden and not passing them on to the societies. When Loudon accused him of uh, plagiarizing material from the ladies' magazine of gardening, which Loudon's wife was running, Glenny replied, Mr. Loudon's uh, wife is a mischievous beldam. We assure him that uh, the material has been published nowhere until in our magazine. We hate old women at the best of times, but a lying old woman is intolerable, and the sooner Mr. Loudon shakes the hag off, the better. <laughs> Loudon's wife was about a quarter of a century younger than he was. Never mind that. By 1840, people like Joseph Paxton and John Lindley were saying, the idea of a white weekly gardening newspaper is a very good one, but couldn't one be devised that would do better than Glenny and be more polite and so on? And the result was the Gardener's Chronicle, started in January 1841, uh, financed in part by Paxton and edited for its first 23 years by Lindley. And unlike any other magazine I'm going to mention in today's talk, this one is still going, although it has changed its name to Horticulture Week and is now only available online. Still, the idea of a weekly gardening newspaper also caught on, and other people attempted to rival it. And one of these was Robert Marnock, who in 1845 started the United Gardeners and Land Stewards Journal. This was a very good moment for launching a weekly gardening newspaper because a matter of months before, Glenny's publishers had got so fed up with the controversies raging around him that they sacked him as the editor and the Gardener's Gazette was absorbed into Marnock's new newspaper. Marnock only edited it for three years. He probably got fed up with it. Um, but it went on for another decade under the title of the Gardener's and Farmer's Journal. But in addition to running uh, gardens, etc., and designing them, he was engaged for over a decade with editing and publication. Now, still in his Yorkshire period, he also designed the Sheffield General Cemetery, which was opened in 1836. Now, this was a time when local authorities had nothing to do with burials. The parish churchyard was the norm for a burial, and the parish churchyard was officially available to anybody who lived in the parish, but it tended to allow only Anglican funeral rites. So, dissenters, Jews, Roman Catholics, etc., had a tendency to want to get additional or other accommodation for bodies. And so from the 1820s on, a number of companies were set up to establish non-denominational cemeteries where anybody could be buried with their own funeral rites. And this was Sheffield's first. And notice there's the long terrace here. 
and the, the long straight roads. There's a lot of, the ground descends quite heavily, so there's a lot of room for informal layout, but the top is really uh, quite formalized. There you can see an illustration uh, of it a few years after opening. And this, this should tell you how these early cemeteries looked rural to the population. They were outside the city limits. And in this case, you have a classical chapel. There's an Egyptian gate. And the general impression of a wooded backdrop and open lawns in the foreground. There are a few recent illustrations. There's your Egyptian gate, the long avenues, and the formal terrace. And as you can see, this cemetery became, from the 1960s onward, very overgrown. And there's now a Friends of the Sheffield General Cemetery um, trying to bring it back. Many of the buildings have been restored, but there is still a lot of overgrowth everywhere. Marnock designed four cemeteries altogether, at least that we know of. Billing Road Cemetery in Northampton is just a scrap of its former self. The chapels have been demolished. Uh, you can hardly trace the outlines of the subordinate paths now, only the, the major road. It had a large circular path in front of the chapels. And probably about two-thirds of the gravestones have been removed also. Stroud General Cemetery is um, reasonably well-maintained, not that interesting design. But the city of Ely Cemetery in 1855 is, um, I find, quite remarkable. As you enter the cemetery, you find yourself walking along a raised walkway. There's no reason for this in the topography of the site. The ground has been made to slope uh, in varying degrees away from the main road. So it stands up as, a, as like a sort of, as I said, elevated walkway. And on the other side from the chapel, there is a large mound with a huge ash growing on it. This was apparently the site of a former windmill, but it's been re-landscaped to form a, par a partial spiral. Now, why did Marnock lay these things out in this manner? And I have, a, I have no documentation for this, but I have a theory. The most famous cemetery north of Sheffield is the Glasgow Necropolis, which you enter by crossing a bridge from the town to the bottom of the site. And probably the most famous cemetery south of Sheffield was Highgate, where there's a cedar of Lebanon emerging from a stone drum containing vaults, etc., in what is called the Lebanon Circle. And I cannot help wondering whether Marnock was trying to provide equivalence for these two designs, but showing how they could be done purely horticulturally without needing architecture to help. As I said, I have no documentation to prove that, but I'm really chuffed with that theory. Well, Marnock did not stay all that long in Sheffield. In 1839, he moved down to London. Once again, having won a competition for a design of a garden, uh, which he settled down to lay out and then become the curator of. And this was the Royal Botanical Society's garden in the inner circle in Regent's Park. When Regent's Park was begun, John Nash's plan was that this was going to be the precincts of a great house for the Prince Regent. There's going to be a great carriage drive, the circular road surrounding the house. But by the time the park was being completed, the Prince Regent had become George IV and had shifted his attention to Buckingham House as a place for development. So Regent's Park opened with a grand carriage drive leading to a circular road around nothing in particular. For its first decade, a nursery occupied the site, and then the Royal Botanic Society took a lease on it a 99-year lease. So there you can see an ordnance survey plan of it. And as with Sheffield, uh, you see the broad walkway creating the axis of symmetry down the entire garden from the entrance to the glass house. There are various uh, gardens for special interests, some of them with elaborate formal designs. 
And over here, there is a rock and water garden. And there you can see the same thing in a colored plan. And you see more detail of the different patterns of layout in some of these sections. This is Marnock's glass house. In the Floricultural Magazine, he had published an article about the making of glass houses and recommended that architects should not design glass houses. We do not want fancy architecture. A glass house should be the lightest possible glass shell over an area of ground to help regulate the temperature and weather and make it possible to grow plants that you couldn't grow outdoors. So here is Marnock's version of it. Um, a single story, pretty much devoid of architectural ornament. And from 1841, the Royal Botanic Society held flower shows, um, again, competing with the horticultural societies. And one of their big attractions was that uh, for one week every year, John Waterer, the nurseryman, was allowed to fill the exhibition tent with his rhododendrons. This is the period when hybrid rhododendron hybridization was just beginning, and Waterer chose the Royal Botanic Society, not the horticultural, as the place to show off uh, his new rhododendron breeding. Well, the Royal Botanic Society came to the end of its 99-year lease, and the society was dissolved. So the Royal Botanic Society is no longer there, the walkway leading up toward the conservatory is still there, but the conservatory has vanished and has been replaced by an open-air theater. Most of the uh, subordinate gardens around the fringe uh, have changed their identity, their planting, and their design. The one bit of the garden that may still be as Marnock left it, I say this somewhat tentatively because there are no illustrations of this surviving from within Marnock's time, is the rock and water garden. The lake at the base of it is still of the same dimensions as it was in Marnock's time as seen on the maps. Whether the rocks are in quite the same arrangement, I cannot say, but I rather think they might be. So if you go to Regent's Park, make sure you look at the rock garden. I think that's the bit of the original that you can still see. While he was in London, Marnock turned his hand to designing gardens for private clients. Here's a small smattering of these. Um, one, as you can see, dates from about uh, 1840. That's Pampersford Hall in Cambridgeshire. Uh, the great period is in the 1860s, after he retired from the Royal Botanic Society's garden. And what sort of people was he designing gardens for? Not generally the nobility, although we do have Warwick Castle for the Earl of Warwick, but more for the gentry. We have a barrister. We have a merchant and philanthropist. We have a cutlery and steel manufacturer. We have a merchant banker. We have a wine merchant who owned a company called the 8th British uh, branch of Schweppes. We have um, a brewer, a bookseller, W. H. Smith the Younger. We have the director of the Daily News. We have a salt mine owner and a biscuit manufacturer and a gardening journalist. So, men with money, but coming out of the world largely of trade. Now, we're just going to look at a few of these. And we'll start with the first of his gardens to really be described, of his private gardens to be described in the gardening press. And this was Dunorlan in near Tunbridge Wells. This contained an ornamental waterfall. From a rustic bridge, you look upon a splendid waterfall with a lily pond and glen immediately beneath. It and 
one of the finest sights in England, the Cedar Avenue leading to the temple. The green grass avenue slopes gently to the northwest and is bordered by cedars and Douglas firs planted alternately. Well, it's no longer a cedar avenue, it's now largely a fir avenue, but at least it is still there. Here are the formal terraces in front of the house. There, a looping walk. It is now a municipal park in Tunbridge Wells, so nothing, nothing to stop you from going and seeing it. This is Berry Hill near Taplow in Buckinghamshire, one of two gardens he made for the varnish manufacturer, John Noble. The house is no longer there, it's been replaced by a block of flats. And I haven't seen the site for about 40 years, and it was in very poor condition then. But William Robinson illustrated this as a model of garden design in his book, The English Flower Garden. So you can see it, ornamental water, a little island. Anything in the way of formal gardening and uh, flower, patterned flower beds, just down in the vicinity of the kitchen garden, the rest lawn studded with single specimens and significant groups of trees. And this became uh, the, the aspect of Marnock's work that Robinson and some of his uh, coevals particularly liked and wanted to publicize. This is Possingworth in Sussex for the merch, uh, merchant banker and uh, art collector Louis Huth. It's now um, a convent, Holy Cross Priory. But Robinson illustrated this in the magazine The Garden, saying, the terrace at Possingworth differs from most of its kind in the absence of the numerous geometrical figures and beds usually considered indispensable to the style. And he admired the few but rather large masses of flowers provided on the terrace. Well, if you look here, these look reasonably geometrical to me. Um, but by comparison with, say, the, uh, the imitation French parterres of uh, Nesfield that uh, were at the height of their popularity at the time, um, they would, would, might appear simple, and to use that highly ambiguous word that uh, Robinson was fond of using, natural. This is Taplow Court in Buckinghamshire, now a Buddhist center, and again, the illustrations chosen to represent Marnock's style show you the sheet of water and the cedar avenue. He was very fond of cedars. This is Greenlands, the garden of W.H. Smith, Jr. And here, Marnock is collaborating with James Pullum. How many of you know the name of Pullum and Son? Four, right. The original James Pullum was one of the pioneers of the manufacture of Portland cement. But his formula was not the one that caught on. And his son, around about 1840, discovered that the, he could put father's formula to use for making artificial rock gardens. You get a batch of brick and clinker together, and you pour the cement mixture over it and mold it boulder by boulder into shape. The typical Pullum rock garden was meant to imitate a sandstone outcrop with rigorously accurate stratification. And it's going somewhat off the screen there, but there is part of the walkway through the rock garden. The author of the text describing this said that, uh, that Marnock had been the original designer, but that uh, Pullum, having been invited to make it, uh, to construct it, improved it. At Warwick Castle, I have found no contemporary illustrations of what Marnock did there, but he designed a rose garden and a peacock garden, um, which is still there, but no doubt considerably altered and replanted since. But this is that Marnock was by no means averse to creating rather fanciful ornamental gardens. Robinson and his quivels might have uh, tried to draw a little veil over that, as uh, inconsistent with the Marnock they liked, but Marnock was rather more various than they were. Now, 
The next garden I'm going to show you is Park Hill Stretton, but behold, one half hour has passed. So you want to break there? 15 minutes. No, 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 save that for the end, please. Right, welcome back. Your local piece of Marnock, Park Hill, Streatham. Marnock was hired to revise the gardens by Henry Tate. The gar there were already extensive gardens there, which had been designed for the previous owner, uh, Walter Leaf. And um, it can sometimes be difficult working out just who did what. But Marnock was in his late 70s when he undertook this project. And once again, he worked with Pullum and Son. And it was written up in Robinson's magazine, The Garden, in 1886, and it was less than 10 years old. Um, but as this was an urban site, uh, things were all taking out, uh, beginning to show the, the signs of degradation that urban life can bring. On, among these trees on the engraving, near it is a Lebanon cedar, but this is apparently feeling the effects of a great town which is stretching towards it. Indeed, almost all the conifers are beginning to show signs of distress air pollution, in other words. The article in the garden was written by a young man named William Goldring, about whom you'll hear more later. But some of the photographs that I'm about to show you were taken by Sir Henry Tate and are in an album of his that is now in the Tate Gallery. And unfortunately, Tate did not photograph the views that Goldring is talking about. Uh, Goldring is talking primarily about the view from the house out toward the lake, uh, whereas Tate tended to stand by the lake and photograph back toward the house. There he is with his wife on the formal parterre. Once again, Marnock his attitude toward the formal parterre is ambiguous because the garden designer can only do so much with the parterre. Its maintenance is subject to the head gardener who stays on site and can alter it every year. So it is possible that Marnock may not have liked this sort of gardening, felt he had to provide it for his clients, etc. But on the other hand, he engaged in exactly this sort of thing at the Sheffield Botanic Garden and at the Royal Botanical Society's Garden. So he may not have had the prejudice against it that some of his um, acclaimers in the late 19th century did. I'm going to go back to that for a moment. Golding described the view of the, of the trees from the house as the nearest approach to perfection in the way of artistic tree grouping that could be seen. The tallest con uh, trees consist of a Lombardy poplar, a black poplar, birches, and a copper beech. Next in size are some laburnums, hemlock spruces, and arbutus, whose gaunt limbs stretch out over the water in the most picturesque way, while in the foreground are pampas grasses, water irises, and other aquatic plants. Both in sky outline and color, this group is charming, and whoever planted it must have had a cultivated taste for such work. On the other hand, a sunk path in imitation of a rocky ravine forms a boundary on one side of the garden. This was the work of Mr. Pullum years ago, and it's decidedly an important feature of the place now that the growth of shrubs and other plants has added to its picturesqueness. The profusion of rocks, however, in one part arouses suspicion as to its artificial origin, and even Mr. Pullum, who always likes to see his work mistaken for nature's work, would not probably praise this particular mass of unclothed and unnatural looking rocks under trees. An artificial rockery must be carried out with consummate taste. A little bit in the home landscape is invaluable, but in excess, it is harmful. And you can tell what he is talking about. The artificial stone ruined tower. 
Now, Pullman's son published um, a whole pamphlet about their work in about 1876, which had a complete list of their commissions up till then. So we know that this work was carried out in 1873, so a few years before Monarch was called in. So Monarch was not responsible for the artificial tower and the gateway, etc. Um, but he didn't take them away, and whether that's simply because he was overruled or because his, uh, he was not as emphatically uh, against that, uh, that taste as Mr. Goldring was, I cannot answer. A garden with a similar name, Park Place in Henley. This is the second garden he made for John Noble, the varnish manufacturer. And here again, there is one feature which seems to us not desirable for imitation, a mosaic flower garden formed after the outline and pattern of a vase. The hard and very artificial character of this mosaic garden makes it far from attractive to those who do not care for elaborate geometry out of books or patterns. But as far as we can tell, it was done by Marnock. One of his largest gardens was Impney Hall near Droitwich, now called Chateau Impney Hotel. And this is made for John Corbett, who had the, the largest salt mines in England. And here, a young gardener named Mungo Temple was the foreman helping to create the gardens. He later went on to a career at gardens in Scotland. And after Marnock's death, he published a little article in the Gardener's Chronicle called Marnock's Maxims, recording the things that Marnock had said to him while they were working on the site together. Uh, among the things that Marnock hated were abrupt slopes, planting in hollows, planting young trees beside old giants of the forest, covering up roots, narrow strips of trees, especially if they shut out the adjacent country. Plantations with jagged outlines when they could be transformed into substantial masses. Trees planted at equal distances showing the boundary of the park or domain. Formal avenues where they could be easily dispensed with. And one of his maxims was that no walk should be brought into view where it could be obscured. As for what it was like working with Marnock, Mungo Temple said, when performing the duties associated with his profession, he made a long day's work. Once, when at Tuan in Wales, we started to mark trees and plan spaces for planting an old neglected park. The day's work was begun at daylight and finished only as darkness set in. Rain was not a barrier to active work, and his memory seemed in full vigor when approaching 80 years of age. This is his last country house commission, Rousden, for Henry Peak of the Peak Freen Biscuit Company. Um, so the house still survives, it's now in multiple ownership. The gardens, less so, but this is the period at which the idea of massing trees and shrubs by color was in the ascendant, and the avenue of purple leafed plums is still there leading up to the house. This, he was working on this up to 1879 when he retired from landscape work, or so it is sometimes said. But in 1884, he came out to visit his protege, William Robinson, and give advice on Robinson's new garden at Gravetime Manor. Robinson's tree and shrub book, uh, his manuscript, shows various occasions when Monarch visited and gave advice. But when he published this in book form as Gravetime Manor in 1911, the only reference to Marnock surviving in it is a reference to Robinson deciding not to follow his advice about the location of the kitchen garden. Well, Marnock also designed a pure town garden on at least one occasion, Montague House for the Duke of Buccleuch. William Goldring again wrote this up and praised it for the the lawn and the absolute clarity of design, flower beds confined just uh, to one continuous curve, and shrubberies and individual groups of trees scattered through the estate. At some point in the 1870s, Monarch was also called in to help redesign the gardens of the Inner Temple. 
No plans, as far as I can tell, survive of what he did. Uh, the minutes are not that forthcoming. Uh, so how much, of the, how much of the current contouring is monarchs, uh, I can't say. But he did plant these two rows of uh, planes to help shield the, um, the gardens from the river and the road because the Thames had now been um, embanked by Basil Jet's uh, sewerage works and the area of the garden had shrunk and it was more exposed to traffic. Well, Monarch also designed some public parks. This one is Weston Park, Sheffield, where he went back to his uh, site of first success. Sheffield Council had bought this house, which they turned into an art, a museum and art gallery. And Marnock, 1873 to 1875, was busy transforming the site, laying down a new path structure, creating a lake. And there you can see um, an old Edwardian postcard and a view photographed about 15 years ago showing the, um, the, in, the one, in that case, the edge of the water and the absence of straight lines in the paths. Two years after finishing Weston Park, Monarch was called in to design Alexandra Park in Hastings. And this is his most interesting park. As you can see, it's a long, linear park dividing into a Y shape. It starts with a formal terrace here, then a series of four ponds, all uh, laid out in concrete. And then gradually, as you work down the park, uh, the, the planting becomes thicker and heavier and the tree collection more dominant. There, from the opening ceremony in 1882, this view shows you what the, uh, the view down the park looked like at, uh, at the time. And in 1889, 10 years after he is uh, generally said to have retired from landscaping work, he was now living at Tunbridge Wells, and he designed, uh, sorry, that's a postcard and a modern photograph of Alexandra uh, Park in Hastings. What was originally called the Grosvenor Recreation Ground and later became Grosvenor Park um, in Tunbridge Wells. And here, the outlines of everything are pretty much as they were in Marnock's time. And they are very proud of Marnock there. And this uh, lake is now called Marnock Lake. But at the time, uh, Marnock was approaching 90, and um, death would be upon him soon. But he was still doing some practical design. Now, in his later years, Marnock had an enthusiastic entourage of gardeners who looked up to him and wanted to carry his principles, or at least a certain selected range of them, forward. Some of them uh, trained under him at the Royal Botanic Society, and others worked for him as foreman on different projects. So I'm going to introduce you to four of the four most important of these. First of all, Alexander Mackenzie. He was responsible for creating the Victoria Embankment Gardens on the north side of the Thames. He designed two parks in London, Finsbury Park and Southwark Park, both of which have very prominent lakes uh, an absence, or at least initially an absence, Finsbury Park has added flower beds since, uh, of anything like formal design and a concentration on trees and shrubs. But his main occupation was as first the designer and then for many years the curator of Alexandra Palace's gardens. Now, Alexander Palace sits on the top of Muswell Hill, looking across London toward the Crystal Palace on Sydenham Hill. The Crystal Palace, which could be seen for miles, had an immense formal geometric 
outline, a great path descending the hillside flanked by cascades, formal terrace on the top, the side of Alexander Palace facing it, Mackenzie did exactly the opposite. Instead of having a carriage drive descending from the, uh, the building, his carriage drive curves around and cuts twice across where an axis would have been. So it is the exact opposite in design principles of Crystal Palace. Secondly, Joseph Meston. He is a very undocumented figure. He was Mackenzie's foreman on making the Victoria Embankment Gardens. He was Marnock's foreman on making Weston Park and some of his other projects. He inherited Marnock's business when Marnock retired. Neston's papers don't survive, and possibly that's the reason why so little of Marnock's papers also survive, because if he took over Marnock's business, he presumably got a lot of paperwork. So if you want to know what sort of things Meston did on his own, I can think of two in the London area. One is Hampstead Cemetery, and the other is Bedford Square, where the existing tree cover, etc., in the square was destroyed during a storm in the 1880s, and Meston redesigned and replanted it. Third, William Robinson, who worked in the herbaceous department of the Royal Botanic Society's garden at Regent's Park for several years. Robinson was primarily a journalist. When he left Regent's Park, he became a gardening correspondent for the Times and went to Paris to cover the horticultural aspects of the Great Exhibition of 1867. He then started up his own magazine, The Garden, which during its first half dozen years or so is really the house organ of the Marnock Appreciation Society. Nearly every new garden described in its pages, certainly every new garden illustrated, is a garden by Marnock. He dedicated one of the volumes of the garden to Marnock. And in his uh, book, The English Flower Garden, as you've already seen, he reproduced one of Marnock's plans as the ideal for designing a garden. Now, for some years in the 1880s, Robinson had a protege working at the garden named William Goldring. Uh, he went around the country reporting on various gardens and then launched himself on a career as a landscape designer. He may also have been a foreman for Marnock on Alexandra Park Hastings. The evidence is a bit ambiguous, but he is stated in one newspaper account to have been involved there. And Goldring, on two occasions, the most important being Impney Hall, extended a Marnock garden and added to it in the same style. During his last years, Marnock lived during the winter in Tunbridge Wells, um, latterly at a uh, house in Marylebone Road, and spent the summers up in Aberdeenshire, where he was born, um, looking for wild flowers, etc. He died on the 15th of November, 1889, he was cremated at the new crematorium at Woking, and his remains were deposited in Kensal Green Cemetery. That's the block there. There you can see the inscription. Right behind the grave of John Claudius Loudon. So the two uh, great, in part rival, gardeners, garden designers, cemetery designers, editors, etc., are buried side by side. So the next time you're going to Kensal Green, go along the main avenue, and you come to the circular road that starts off on the left, going around after Ducrow's grave, follow it around, and if you come to Thomas Hood's monument, you know you've just passed Loudon and Marnock. Well, there ends my account of Robert Marnock, and if there are any questions that you would like to ask, uh, please feel free. I take it from what you said that the exact work that Marnock did for uh, Henry Tate at Park Hill um, is not known. We have no surviving plans or details, do we, of his work there? We have no surviving plans. Uh, 
we know that the rock work in the shape of the um, ruined folly uh, was done before Monarch arrived. We assume that the horticultural work that was done there, as opposed to architectural, um, after that was done by Monarch, but it's difficult to be certain in detail. Was Robert Morrison Monarch a relation, the architect? I do not know Robert Morrison Monarch, so I can't answer that question. One. Um, do you know if um, Robert Monarch had any connections with Frederick G. Olmsted, the American garden designer who was also in, in Britain and Europe designing gardens? None that I know of. But Robinson is about the only British gardening journalist of the 19th century to discuss Olmsted at all. So the there's a possibility there that Monarch at, uh, at least knew of Olmsted's work or maybe learned a bit from Robinson. Hmm. But um, no contact between them that I know of. Right, but it's working in a... ...found uh, at um, uh, Ely, wasn't yep. it? And you mentioned that there was a, um, a cemetery north of Sheffield. I didn't catch the name of that. Okay, my, my thought was that Marnock was uh, aiming to find horticultural rather than architectural equivalents to two of the big features of landscape in cemeteries at that time. Uh, and the one north of Sheffield was Glasgow Necropolis, right. where you cross into the cemetery via a bridge. Yep. And the one south of Sheffield was Highgate. Yes. You have the cedar, well, you had until recently the Cedar of Lebanon towering over. The, and he the was somewhere. a believer, wasn't he, in, in cremation, so rather like mm. William Robinson. Um, he got cremated, and, and one wonders whether he was a, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, a proponent of that and a shareholder, perhaps, of Golders Green, maybe, or... Um, no, he was not a shareholder of Golders Green because Golders Green wasn't founded until after he had died. Ah, okay, okay. So the only the crematorium... Uh, well, sorry, the, the only crematorium functioning at the time that Monarch died was Woking. That was the first, and it had been founded about four years before he died. And cremation had been declared legal less than a decade before. I don't see any more questions. But, so all I it leaves me to do is to um, once again, um, excuse me, uh, thank you um, to Dr. Brent Elliott for a fascinating talk. Um, left us perhaps with more mysteries than we'd hoped about uh, exactly what happened at Park Hill, but I'm sure there's still a possibility that we might find out uh, something more. Um, please, we'll try to get the lights up just to um, allow you to have a quick look at the uh, displays before we take them down. Um, do keep an eye out for the rest of um, stuff that's going on for this year as part of um, the Marnock, uh, is it, I was going to say, sesquicentennial this year? Yeah. Um, and uh, it certainly um, enticed me to go and look at bits of Sheffield I'd never thought of them looking at before. Um, a reminder that we have still got the spaces available for the tours at Park Hill this Sunday, and I'm afraid we haven't got any remaining programmes for the rest of the Lambeth Heritage Festival, um, but there are still a few walks and talks happening during the rest of this month, but um, they are online, so please do um, take a look. So can I have a uh, show of hands, please, uh, for our speaker this evening? Thank you. Thank you.